I am sick and tired of all of these cowards in the Twitter streets, in the YouTube comments, in the fantasy football world. I'm out here sitting in my chair all day, grinding, doing projections, putting together rankings, looking with an optimistic lens at all of the players across the fantasy football landscape, hoping, wishing, even thinking that they're going to hit their ceiling this season. And then I got people in my mentions. I, I see tweets. I see YouTube videos. Derrick Henry's going to get hurt. Christian McCaffrey can't stay healthy. so and so's going to have touchdown regression. James Conner sucks balls. I'm sick of it. It makes me want to say, what the fuck is up with all these people who hate football? Which is why I'm Noah Hills. You can find me on Twitter at No More Parties. And in today's video, we're going to prize picks. We're using promo code BDGE and replacing some bets. And today, we're just smashing overs on some of my favorite players, some of my favorite season long lines. Let's do it. The first guy I want to talk about, and the first line I want to talk about, is T. Higgins' season long receptions prop of 73 and a half, and I am obviously smashing the over. Last season, T. Higgins had 74 receptions in 14 games, so he already he already hit the over on this last year in not even a full season, and those 74 receptions gave him a 17-game pace of 90 receptions. He was on pace to lead the Bengals in targets and receptions over a 17-game pace ahead of Jamar Chase, Technically, he was the wide receiver one on that team last year. And the 2021 Bengals offense was 20th in passing attempts, 7th in passing yards, 3rd in net yards per pass attempt, 4th in explosive pass rate, so passes that went at least 15 yards, and 11th in early down pass rate. So what do those things mean? First there, 20th in pass attempts. They were towards the bottom of the league in total like passing volume, just how many times they're dropping back and chucking the ball below average. And yet because of an explosive play rate that they were able to ride to like really high marks in yards per attempt and yards overall, despite low passing volume, they were one of the like most productive passing offenses in the league with a philosophical bent to like throwing the ball early and often. First and second down when the playbook is wide open, you know, early down pass rate in neutral game script situations, the Bengals were lining up to pass the ball at an above average rate near the top 10 in the league, so they were a super efficient offense with a pass heavy philosophy, but low attempt volume overall, in part because they were so efficient. You don't have to throw the ball 15 times if you have, you know, two different 40 yard bombs in the same drive that keep your, you know, attempt volume low. But Joe Burrow has acknowledged this offseason that the Bengals are going to have to rely on less big plays in 2022 given that teams are going to play more too high looks against them and kind of protect against those deep throws down the field. But the Bengals still have the personnel and they still have the desire to throw the ball. And if they make those adjustments and look more towards like underneath looks in the middle of the field, in the shorter areas of the field, that equals fewer explosive plays, which equals lower per attempt efficiency, which equals more methodical drives, which equals more receptions and lower yards per reception for their wide receivers. There, were, there was a lot of cushion in last year's numbers for T. Higgins to still hit this line if he was able to stay healthy for the whole year, but I think the game plan in 2022 is going to be more conducive to hitting this line than it was last year anyway. So T. Higgins was already on pace for this last year, already hit it last year despite missing games, and I think he and Jamar Chase both could see higher numbers in receptions totals in 2022 given that the Bengals will likely need to see more methodical drives, less deep shots down the field. The next guy I want to talk about is Trey Lance and his rushing yards prop of 500.5 yards. We're smashing the over. This is a guy who ran for 1,100 yards in 16 games as a true sophomore at North Dakota State, a guy who has 80th percentile speed. He runs like a 4.6 in the 40, and he had... He was 33% of the way to hitting the over on this prop last season, even though he played in only six games and only started two games. He got solid run in two and a half games, those two starts, as well as one other game where he played the second half after Jimmy Garoppolo left with an injury. And in those two and a half games, Trey Lance had 31 carries for 161 yards. That's a 17 game pace of 1,095 rushing yards. They've now had an entire off season to tailor this offense to Trey Lance's strengths. Mobility is a huge part of that. 
unless this dude misses five games or more, like, I think he's more likely to double this line than he is to hit the under. I am absolutely smashing the over on Trey Lance, 500 rushing yards. The next guy I want to talk about is Justin Jefferson and his receptions prop, which is currently at 99 and a half over at prize picks. We're smashing the over. Last year, Justin Jefferson had 108 receptions on a team in Minnesota that was 18th in the league in early down pass rate and was 11th overall in total pass attempts. He also had 88 receptions as a rookie in 2020 on a Vikings team that was 27th in the league in both early down pass rate and total pass attempts. So he's played on offenses here that it situationally don't want to throw the ball at a league average rate. And last season threw the ball more often than they would have liked, given just kind of like the game circumstances they found themselves in. But ultimately, like this is this has been a team that has like a run first philosophy. Where now with new head coach Kevin O'Connell coming over from the Sean McVay system with the Rams, the last two seasons in early down pass rate, they've been 10th and 5th in the league. So much more pass heavy than the Vikings have been in those situations. And then 12th and 10th in total passing volume as far as attempts go. So they've been near the top of the league, in passing volume and especially in like what they want to do situationally this is a pass heavy system so this is going to be a a more pass heavy offense Justin Jefferson is going to see easier probably more quick hitting targets in this Cooper Cup role that they've talked about him playing in this next season last season Justin Jefferson had the 24th highest average depth of target among all wide receivers league wide and had the 52nd most slot snaps of all wide receivers. So he was seeing a lot of targets down the field. He was number one in deep targets, number one in total air yards, but he was not lining up in the slot very much at all. He was he was playing outside a lot, a lot of deep targets running deep routes downfield, whereas Cooper Cup at the Rams saw the 75th highest eight out in the league. So much, much lower depth of target than, than Justin Jefferson was seeing. And he had the third most slot snaps of all wide receivers. So if Justin Jefferson has a role that it doesn't even need to look the same as Cooper Cups, but even if it's just a little bit more like that, he's going to see easier work on the inside, shorter throws, which equals more receptions, you know, dinking and dunking down the field is more conducive to receptions than, you know, bombing it obviously 40 yards downfield on these long throws. So if he's doing that, that's conducive, that's conducive to more receptions. And Justin Jefferson already went for 108 last year while essentially shooting mid-range jumpers all season. And now... He's going to be getting transition layups out of the slot. I could see Justin Jefferson approaching like 130 receptions this year. I think he goes over this prop of 99.5. The next guy I want to talk about is C.D. Lamb and his receiving touchdowns line of 7.5 were smashed in the over. He scored five touchdowns as a rookie, six touchdowns as a sophomore last season, and now he's really kind of the last man standing in this Dallas passing offense. Amari Cooper is completely gone. Michael Gallup is still recovering from a torn ACL. Who knows when he'll be back? And last season, the Cowboys were first in the NFL in points, first in the NFL in yards, third in the NFL in both passing yards and passing touchdowns, eighth in the NFL in early down pass rate, fourth in the NFL in red zone pass rate. This is a team that has an explosive, efficient offense, a prolific offense, and a pass-heavy offense regardless of the situation. It can be first down. It can be second down. It can be in the red zone. These guys want to throw the ball all over the yard. Last season, they had 100 red zone pass attempts, 28 red zone passing touchdowns. Amari Cooper and Michael Gallup combined for 25 red zone targets and six red zone touchdowns. If CeeDee Lamb gets just two of those, Amari Cooper's leaving behind five. Michael Gallup, who knows what happens? He, he scored one last year. If CeeDee Lamb gets just two of those added to his, his touchdown totals from last season, he hits this he hits this over and that's ignoring that he caught only 40% of his own red zone targets last year like a couple more random balls are a little bit more catchable or he, he holds on here and there or something doesn't get you know batted down a couple more of those go his way he would have hit this last season even with Amari Cooper and Michael Gallup playing the average team receiving touchdown leader across the entire NFL caught seven and a half receiving touchdowns last season and 15 of those guys had at least eight. This line that CeeDee Lamb has, seven and a half receiving touchdowns, is completely, it's a completely average benchmark for like number one wide receivers across the league. And CeeDee Lamb is the clear alpha on one of the most prolific passing offenses in the NFL. His target competition is falling like flies. Seven and a half touchdowns should not be a problem for this dude. He's big, he's good, he's going to get funnel targets, and they like to throw the ball. I would be shocked if he doesn't score at least eight receiving touchdowns this season. The last props I want to talk about are three rushing yards props from college football. 
Over on prize picks, go over to CFB Futures. We got Bijan Robinson from Texas. Maybe the next Saquon Barkley. His rushing yards prop right now over on prize picks is 1,162.5 yards. Last year, in only 10 games, he rushed for 1,127. So he missed this by like 40 yards while missing two games, playing at a 1,352 rushing yard pace over the course of a full season. And I think it's likely that he's going to be even better this next season. He's the RB1 in the class of 2023, that legendary running back class. And, you know, high-end blue chip running back prospects who've been like first, second round guys going into their junior seasons from the past, like Todd Gurley, Melvin Gordon, Adrian Peterson, Zeke Elliott, Joe Mixon, Saquon Barkley, Leonard Fournette, like these dudes get better from their sophomore to junior seasons. Todd Gurley increased his rushing yards per game at Georgia from by 52 yards from sophomore to junior season. Melvin Gordon improved by 61 yards from sophomore to junior season. Adrian Peterson added 44 yards. Derrick Henry added 77. Zeke Elliott added 15. Joe Mixon added 48. Uh, guys like Brees Hall, Saquon Barkley, Dalvin Cook all dropped by between 5 and 9 yards. So like barely a drop off. If Bijan Robinson does that, he's still going to smash this if he stays healthy. Leonard Fournette dropped his, his rushing yards per game by like 42 but Darius Geis came in and took a lot of that workload. There's not a guy here who's established in the way that Darius Geis was that's going to take a bunch of work from Bijan Robinson. He's going to follow in the footsteps of like Todd Gurley, Melvin Gordon, Joe Mixon, take a jump up from where he already was last season. I would be surprised if he stays healthy and does not hit this rushing prop. The next guy is Sean Tucker for Syracuse. His prop is currently 1,175.5 rushing yards. We're smashing the over, of course, because basically the case for him is last season he played 12 games, ran for 1,500 yards. Why would he suddenly lose 300 yards off of his rushing performance? He's basically like a, like a Kenneth Walker type prospect. Like he's he's a, a little bit undersized. He's super fast and explosive. He plays on like not a mid-major, but, you know, like a Power 5 team that's just not that good in Syracuse. But he is the offense. They didn't lose a whole lot of people from their offense from last season. Sean Tucker, if he goes less than 1,200 yards, I will be blown away. The last guy is Jameer Gibbs, whose rushing yards line right now is 901.5. Last season, he ran for 746 yards in 12 games at Georgia Tech. And that was a Georgia Tech team that went 3-9 and nine and was outscored by 114 points over the course of last season. Jameer Gibbs was the best player on that team, and now he plays for Alabama. He transferred. Alabama's offense gained 7,324 yards last year, while Georgia Tech's offense gained 4,406. That's a difference of almost 3,000 yards in overall offensive productivity that Jameer Gibbs will now benefit from. And in 15 years with Nick Saban as the Alabama head coach, their running back rushing leader has averaged 1,280 rushing yards per season. And their rushing leader in a given season has hit below 901.5 rushing yards only three times in the last 15 years. And all three of those times, their rushing leader was within 27 yards of hitting this over. The main running back at Alabama always runs for a lot of yards. This is a good offense. And even if even since they became an explosive passing offense in 2018, so you want to say, okay, they used to run the ball a ton with Mark Ingram and Eddie Lacy and all those dudes. Even since 2018, when they've started throwing the ball all around the yard, Damian Harris had 876 yards as the rushing leader in 2018. That's like, what, 26 yards shy of this prop, while Najee Harris and Josh Jacobs on the same team also had over 100 carries and at least 640 yards on the ground each. Like, that was a three-headed backfield where all of these guys were heavily involved. And since then, Najee Harris hit 1,200 yards. Najee Harris approached 1,500 yards. Brian Robinson hit 1,300 yards. Alabama lead backs have averaged 244 carries per season on a 60% carry share in the last three seasons. And going into 2022, Alabama returns just three guys who've ever run the ball in college other than Jameer Gibbs. And those three guys, I believe that's Jace McClellan, Roy Dell Williams, and Trey Sanders. Those guys have a combined 232 career carries in 37 career games. That's 6.3 total carries per game, like, combined. Those guys might get a little bit more work. And while, you know, I don't think Jameer Gibbs needs the backfield to himself to hit this over... But it might just be the Jameer Gibbs show in the Alabama backfield this season. Historical precedent tells us that he's going to, at the very least, get very, very close to this. And the vast majority of Alabama runners in the last decade and a half have absolutely smashed this line. Jameer Gibbs is talented. I expect him to do the same thing.